Thank you very much. Um, hope everybody's having an awesome time uh, at the event. I know it's definitely not what we would like it to be, but hey, we're doing doing what we can. Um, so again, this is first year for the open source program office track. Um, so hopefully you've seen some great material there as well as uh, the business track. Um, I'm guessing anybody who's kind of coming to this session has it on their mind that they're thinking about trying to do something more strategic with open source in their organization. So both of those tracks are gonna make a whole lot of sense. Um, and if you miss sessions, uh, I know a lot of them, well, they're all gonna be recorded and thrown up on YouTube. Uh, so just give it a little bit of time and Todd and team will make that happen for you. Um, so a little bit of background, who am I? Um, so Justin Ratcliffe, uh, that's already been, been mentioned. Um, I am the open source program office lead at Fidelity Investments. Um, one of the, some of the primary stuff I do is I interface with Linux Foundation. Um, I am a member of uh, the to-do group. Um, again, that's probably been a common theme if you've been in any of the sessions. Uh, you've been hearing that name come up a lot and it's really around open source program office leads and members and those related to it, uh, trying to learn from each other, uh, bouncing ideas off each other and um, generally a, a pretty cool place to hang out. And how I kind of define my role is um, helping associates within Fidelity do some awesome things with open source. Um, and to recognize as a shared responsibility, uh, we're all going to have to figure this out together uh, this is not going to be some giant bureaucracy or anything along those lines. Um, and since this is a virtual thing, um, I am in North Carolina. I am in Triangle Park. I live in Cary. Uh, so normally this is kind of a fun event for me because I get to, to drive to the event and then go home and see my family. Um, so a little bit bummed, uh, although the weather is, is phenomenal outside. Um, so what we're, we're going to make do. Um, and, and just a lens um, that is just a reality for me, um, there's a bias uh, because I'm a regulated party, because of the history of fidelity, because of a whole lot of things. Um, some of the things that I'll emphasize in this talk reflect kind of where I sit in the industry or my organization sits in the industry. Um, and so for, for me, I have a, a bias towards things around compliance, things around reg regulations and policies um, and, and contributing upstream as opposed to releasing works. But they're all important. Um, but just to know that, that every, every organization is gonna be a little different. Um, and that is, come on, why aren't you, why aren't you moving? Oh, of course. Try that. Nope. There it is. Um, so why are you here? Um, it, why are you at an event about open source? Well, because it's important. Uh, every it, there's so many surveys that go out and talk about the the criticality of open source. Uh, how much of our commercial enterprise depends on open source? Um, these things are just they're essential. They're part of how we do business now, and uh, when 80, 90% of the code base that you're dealing with, whether it's a cloud service or some other uh, product capability um, that you're pulling off of GitHub, uh, it's all gonna be open source. Um, and again, there's a whole lot of, of benefits to undifferentiated heavy lifting, um, but uh, there's some responsibilities that we all have to be aware of. And I think more and more organizations are figuring out that this isn't just a passive thing. Um, you can get into trouble. Um, I would say uh, another thing was, if you're not clear with your developers, they're gonna be risk averse, uh, especially in these, this day and age. Uh, they don't wanna do things that put their career in jeopardy. Um, so they may be less willing to innovate, less willing to experiment. And we have to recognize uh, as organizations that it's important to put policies and to put process in place that allows people to feel free, uh, feel free to collaborate, feel free to, to be involved and to do cool things. 
um, and that organizations do have their responsibilities too. Uh, so we have to be able to be there to, to meet those. Um, there it is. Um, again, the goal of the OSPO, at least for me, is to enable, inspire, and catalyze teams to do better things, to make that next best choice, um, but also educating them on their responsibility. Um, it, it's key. Education will always be a stream for the open source program office. In, a, in some ways, it's a moving target as well. Um, the things that you had to learn um, a couple of years ago, as we looked at big events from Apache Struts, uh, with other financial parties and people's personal data um, are very different than maybe a container thing or a cloud thing. Um, so it becomes this very evolving narrative that is responsive to your organization based around where they're at. Um, so what are you going to get out of this? Uh, I, I always have a firm belief that you need to be able to get, if you're going to spend your time, uh, if your, your organization is going to invest time, um, what are you going to get out of this? So my goal is three handles. I call them three C's because everybody likes a little, little hook um, to help frame a discussion around uh, open source, to do an elevator pitch. Um, and basically on, on how you want to take that message and refine it in a way that makes sense. It makes sense to your manager. It makes sense to your execs. It makes sense to any of the stakeholders from your security or legal or purchasing organizations that you're gonna have a conversation with. Um, so uh, call out to yesterday, Matt, uh, at his uh, keynote um, and called on uh, Simon Wardley's uh, quote around Devin's paradox. Uh, this is a common tripping point a lot of people think that open source or, or, or uh, software is a zero sum game. And that's the evidence that it's not. The more that we can invest in this kind of this core uh, thing that we call open source, the larger the marketplace, uh, the more participants, the more innovation. Um, and we need to be able to, to be able to start that, to get that message across to those who, who are the decision makers in our organization and commonly the open source program office becomes that, that voice or a voice uh, that, that takes developer responsibilities and industry trends around open source and turns them into uh, business statements that make sense to the organization in question. Um, one thing to always remember, every organization has a different culture. It has a heritage, it has a story that is unique to that organization. Um, and it needs to be reflected in your, in your proposal because you're not trying to solve, the, uh, solve things forever. You're maybe six months out, one year out. Uh, you'll continually learn and refine this message um, and potentially grow that, that role and responsibility. Um, it's very, you have to be very cautious on copy pasting culture. Um, I don't find it works pretty, very well um, because it just doesn't, it creates a little bit of rejection within the organization because it's not organic. It didn't come from them. So the, the three C's are designed to be prescript, uh, to not be prescriptive, but to be descriptive. Uh, so you're not going to find a checklist here, uh, that's going to be able to answer the questions, but hopefully it just gives you a little bit of framework and a few handles, uh, to get things moving around. So. This is everybody's favorite and coming from a regulated space. Um, it's, it's kind of the one that I wear on my head most of the time. Um, oftentimes it's where people start uh, compliance. And it could have been some, some newspaper thing, some big vulnerability. Um, and then the executive team comes down and says, where are we with this? And again, it's a very risk uh, risk averse approach or a risk motivated approach. Um, a little bit of fear that's there, but we all start somewhere. Um, sometimes fear can be a, a good motivator. It get, gets people moving and helps them understand that things are important. Um, the OSPO can be there, a lot of times it can be a response to this, but it can be there to take that, that initial kind of knee jerk reaction and then not just resolve that, 
um, not just kind of handle it and make it feel comfortable, but also can then catalyze this thing to move forward, um, to start uh, disrupting things. Um, so what we want to be able to do is when we're talking about usage, consumption of open source, we'll start there and we'll help to refine that, make sure there's a licensing policy, make sure there's an open source policy. Uh, we'll start to provide framework for the developers to do things well and then for us to measure it so that we can go back to our auditors and show them that, yeah, we are doing things well um, and let them feel comfortable. That was, let's go. Um, one of the kind of key things that can sometimes be lost in the compliance mindset is when you're doing some of this work, uh, John Mark kind of called this off in the previous session, when you're scanning, you're understanding your, your portfolio, um, sometimes that data, just, that just data just ends up in security or it ends up in legal um, and people check licenses or they check public vulnerabilities or something like that. Um, one thing that you can definitely use this data for is helping to build consensus. Make this data available. Um, I, I kind of, I always frame this around like I'm an Am Amazon shopping cart. Uh, we're all going out there, we're all trying to find something, and all of a sudden we're exposed to what other people have selected and what other people thought of the things that they selected. And what that may do is it may guide us in certain directions. Um, now, again, we're not buying a spatula, but picking out an NPM package might be in that same space. It might feel that way. Uh, it's very utilitarian. Um, so if you can say, hey, this, this package looks a lot like this one, or it's from this ecosystem, or your business unit might have these priorities and want to be playing in this ecosystem more than another one, uh, making that data available to, available to your developers is very important. Uh, it allows them to kind of build these communities organically. They can reach out and build relationships. Um, and it also allows them, because we're all a little bit risk averse, especially these days, um, it allows them to see where the, the, the thing that they found may not have the best track record. Or um, in, the, in the financial services area, it's a buy, hold, or sell. Um, is, this, is this project growing? Um, Don Foster did a great uh, discussion in the business track around kind of the, the health of ecosystems and health of, of communities and how that can influence risk. So what we want to be able to do is to direct, is kind of nudge people uh, and nudge our developers in, in good directions, help them make the best choice. Um, you don't you don't want to focus on gates or bureaucracy to try to control things. Um, it doesn't end up well. Uh, tend to be a lot of shadow IT at that point. Uh, the focus should be around guardrails, helping people avoid driving off a cliff, but they still need to drive the car. Uh, there's still some responsibilities there. And being clear with your motivations on why this thing made sense. Um, and on the bureaucracy side, um, I'm an open source program office of one. Um, the session following this one, which I'm also in, um, we'll talk about kind of the diversity of open source program offices. Um, maybe it's because I'm in a, in a kind of mature organization. Um, I have a, a adverse reaction to heavy bureau bureaucracy, uh, but it doesn't mean that I can do everything. What it, what it means is I build my network. So I have my relationships with legal, with procurement, with audit, any of the organizations um, I build partnerships with. So that way it doesn't become the, the faceless bureaucracy, um, but, but something that's a, a network of relationships that I can send people to and pull people in. Um, it helps to keep things lean, uh, helps keep things responsive to the changes in organizational priorities. Uh, and not just kind of this open source silo. So the next C, community. Um, in any organization, unless you're really, really small, you're gonna start to see silos. Um, 
as we look at agile, this could be in the context of squads, it could be in the context or Spotify for tribes or domains. Uh, they're how we scale, because again, as the organization grows, you need to be able to, to stratify it a little bit, hopefully a little bit. Um, and that's good and it's healthy and it's kind of needed to make sure that we can still deliver on our responsibilities, but it can also become an impediment to, to uh, working together. And all of a sudden you start getting different answers to the same problem. Uh, we see this a lot in open source. It's natural, it's organic. Uh, it's not a bad thing by itself, but if we can combine our efforts um, in the open source environment, we've seen how that can make a difference. Um, it doesn't mean there needs to be one answer, but it, there also shouldn't be a hundred because um, it becomes a resource thing. All of those different communities need to exist and they need to have ongoing investment. So if we can kind of marshal all of those resources into fewer answers, hey, maybe, maybe we can do some cool stuff. Um, so one kind of practice as your, as your program office kind of evolves that you should be looking into is applying open source principles inside your wall. Um, Nithya called this out um, uh, on the other track a little bit earlier. Uh, so the inner source commons, that's what that logo is. It kind of looks like zebra, kind of looks like it. It should give you a little bit of a headache. Um, but what you're doing is you're applying these principles that have been proven in open source on collaboration, collaboration between parties that, that don't share uh, common goals or, or common vid visions, uh, but end up resulting in some, some pretty cool stuff coming because they build trust. And we, we kind of figure out what, what community norms look like, what governance looks like, um, how to operate a little bit neut uh, more neutral um, in these ecosystems. Can't get rid of your bias. We all carry it. Uh, but we can understand what that means to, to build towards consensus. Um, understanding that, that if we all can come to standard answers, that, okay, cool, that, that's something that allows uh, Again, Jevons paradox, um, once you get to that common answer, you can create unique kind of implementations of that. Um, you can riff on it. And the, each organization can be responsible for their little uh, perspective, but it doesn't take away from the entire thing. Um, you're gonna be looking at your conduct. As you break down these silos, you have businesses that whether they didn't compete directly they just didn't talk um, as they're now communicating with each other, maybe some friction and some uh, code of conduct violations might show up. Um, so the important thing is gonna be happening there. It's happening behind your firewall. Um, build these skills internally. Uh, there's a lot of benefit there. Because as, they, as you kind of move beyond this continuum and you, you start working externally, whether it's in a foundation managed project, your own project, uh, somebody else's project, you don't want to be responding um, to, hey, your associate was, was acting inappropriately in my community. Um, can you help? That's just, it's, it's difficult, it's ugly. Um, you want to reduce those things as much as possible. Um, so helping teams understand what open source means, again, behind the, behind the firewall, um, can make a big difference. And it helps build that accountability, that they feel responsible here. They understand that it's not just about their particular goals. Um, it's also about uh, the community and is about the brand itself that they're representing. Uh, so build those skills, um, develop and mature there. And then the third C is character. Um, so when we think about open source, we think about this kind of external brand, uh, whether that is somebody's GitHub user, uh, user space, uh, when I think about the organizations they affiliate with, um, it's on display for everybody to see. 
And oftentimes with an organization, regulated or not, that's a sensitive topic. Um, people can get really, really concerned about what, what that means to the brand because there's, there's a little bit of risk there. And, but it, you can't not do it. It's not open source if there's not the openness. Uh, so we have to learn what it, what it means, how to do it well. Uh, so again, another call out to the to-do group. There's huge opportunity. Um, not always, uh, no, no, no community is gonna be perfect, um, but there's plenty of them to learn from. Uh, it's a willingness to go in, to listen, um, to chop wood and carry water, as uh, Sarah Novotny would, see, would say, um, really try and to, to learn. Um, as an organization, I feel like I'm learning all the time. Um, there's new things that I'm being exposed to. I, I'm not a career open source person. Um, I've interacted with open source for a significant part of my career but it wasn't something that kind of <laughs> could go paid my bill. Um, so I'm constantly learning both from uh, new organizations, those who are coming at it with a set of fresh eyes and a certain perspective because of the business domain that they're in, um, to those who are incredibly mature, who, have, <laughs> who authored standards that I would read in school. Um, and it's amazing to kind of get their perspective around where things have gone. Uh, that they couldn't have guessed, they wouldn't have imagined. Um, if they did, they, they could have been retired to a far off island someplace. Um, but uh, from that, that openness perspective, uh, you can get exposed to a lot of stuff if you're just will, willing to learn. Um, and as an organization, uh, a lot of they said about open source sustainability, um, uh, an organization can invest in its passion. What are the projects? So if we go back to that first fee on compliance and, and understanding what your portfolio looks like, um, you'll get a better understanding of what your developers are using. How are they using it? How many developers? And based around that, you can now provide some, some guidance around strategic contributions. That may be, hey, let's be a foundation, uh, foundation member, Linux Foundation, CNCF, uh, CDF, whatever whatever is is kind of exciting you um, and again that's going to be in some ways unique to your organization in foundation membership is great um, it's part of that sustainability story but uh, contribution is something that is essential it's the core of open source so the more that we can do is is help give um, good onboarding to our associates around how they can invest because they're thinking a little bit about themselves. They're thinking about their GitHub resume. Um, but honestly, they're just excited about that work. And they wanna make a difference, whether it's an enhancement or a bug or some documentation, uh, fill in the blank. There needs to be a mechanism to, to take that, that energy and direct it out. Um, it's it, one, especially as an organization, it's a much lower cost than running a work. So releasing a work is expensive. Lots been written about it. Um, it takes dedicated engineers. It takes dedicated marketing. It takes sending people to conferences to get and build a community. All of those things cost dollars. Um, and they are important and they should be part of your portfolio, but it doesn't have to be the only part of your portfolio. Uh, working upstream in, in those same common environments um, it, it's lower cost. Um, you may still get there. You may become a, a, a Kubernetes SIG lead or, or uh, some stratospheric um, role in some major project. But in general, it's going to just be the basics. Um, handling issues, making sure that uh, uh, that first contact on a pull request is met. Um, all of those things really make a difference to those communities and again, the more people that, that pile into that community, um, the better off it may be for all of us. So it's those investments in, in standards and common places that people feel comfortable and excited about 
um, that can really make a difference. Uh, find your consources, find your partners in some ways. Um, that can be a technical project, but it can also be domain level. So uh, John Mark called out uh, FinOps, the financial services organization that, uh, or foundation that joined Linux Foundation recently. Um, there, there are projects that fit under FinOps, but a big part of that is financial services organizations getting together, talking about our shared problems and figuring out, hey, what, the, what are potential common answers? Um, it doesn't mean we always agree, but at least we'll have kind of wrestled with it and be able to a little, uh, do a little retrospective of our own approaches and ask, okay, well, this organization is approaching Kubernetes multi-tenancy uh, this way. So may, can, we, can we move that way or the, do our needs or are our needs different enough that we, gotta, we have to keep going our own direction? Um, so you can still get that kind of fork and merge type of activity because you're exposed to other people. Um, because you're listening, because you're, you're, you're putting things into action. Um, and be engaged. Uh, supporting a foundation, um, doing a gig, uh, investing in, in kind of cross-cutting programs, things like Tidelift, uh, they're all important. Financial parts are a major part of open source. It's just a reality because people have to pay their bills. Um, you can't disconnect that, that part of the motivation. Um, but the investment of, of our expertise, our knowledge, our developers, um, our experience um, can be incredibly valuable to a project. Um, and again, that needs to be weighted as part of your kind of character. How do you help your developers work upstream in a safe way um, in a way that reflects well on the brand. Because um, again, there, there's some risk there uh, and, and helps, again, the, all these communities be a little bit more sustainable. So I said there was three C's, uh, there's actually a fourth. So credibility. Um, one thing to think about is, uh, these kind of three C's, it's like a three-legged stool. Um, they don't really operate unless you have all three. You, you may start off um, with a compliance motivator, but if that's the only place you, you are on kind of consuming open source and just basically um, keeping the auditors off your, off your back, you're missing out on a huge opportunity for your developers to learn from other, other parties, from uh, that are both inside your organization, but also outside your organization and reducing that kind of undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, so, but you also can't be just externally focused and, and not care about policy and not care about process because that's unrealistic for most employees. They're gonna look at their employment contracts or they're gonna look at a, a set of policies and controls or e-communications and social media policies, and they're gonna look at that, that open source and go, oh, it didn't tell me what was safe. Um, it didn't tell me how to approach this problem. So I'm just not gonna do it. Um, that's not where you wanna leave your associates. So you wanna be able to invest in all three spaces. And what that will do is over time, your associates will get more confident. And it does take time, especially if you're a mature organization that's been around for a while. Uh, there's a lot of lessons that have been learned. Uh, there's a lot of, of culture that's been built. And having people understand a big paradigm shift like open source or open collaboration um, can make a big difference, uh, especially when uh, folks like the SEC get bandied around. Um, Again, we want to be able to kind of neutralize some of those myths uh, over time, but you want to build that uh, essentially that credibility through helping associates do cool things. Um, and you just need to be patient. 
Uh, there's going to be days that are going to be wins. Uh, you release a work or a patch gets merged um, or you, you jump in into some uh, tribe meeting or domain meeting or squad meeting and a team is really excited about um, contributing more significantly to another project or strategically. Uh, potentially they were on a commercial product and they want to adopt something open source because they want to have that ownership culture. Um, those, th those are the wins that you, you kind of uh, cherish. Um, and there's gonna be days that that just doesn't happen and that's okay. Um, so uh, be patient, uh, especially if, if this is a new thing for your organization, if your organization has been around uh, for a while. Um, there's a lot of lessons there and people take time um, and they need time to be able to process those changes. Um, measure yourself. So setting up criteria, setting up goals, these don't have to be giant earth moving goals. Um, set small wins, uh, take things day by day. Uh, really look for that, that next best step. Um, trying to be Microsoft is not gonna happen. <laughs> it's gonna be a challenge, uh, but that's the reason Microsoft is Microsoft. Um, and your organization is you. So find those things that make sense to your organization, uh, feed them, nurture them, um, be their voice, be their advocate uh, in, in all those things, be that fresh set of eyes um, to help people understand, hey, this is a practice that uh, Comcast has, has adopted, or this is a practice that Microsoft has adopted or, or Capital One. Um, how can we learn? How do we build those bridges and start those conversations? Um, oftentimes, I feel a little bit like a traffic cop, um, helping get people the best answer. Um, I may have an answer about licensing. Um, I'm still not ex as excited as, as Chris Abona from the keynote this morning, um, but I have read most of them. Um, I, I am not a lawyer, uh, but I do have a good feeling of what they're, what they're saying. So we will have some answers. Uh, but most of the time, the program office's responsibility is to, to build that consensus. Where is legal sit? Where does security sit? Uh, where does our external communication sit? What do they say about this effort? Uh, intellectual property, patents, fill in the blank. blank. Um, you, you tend to be the locus of so many concerns. And then you try to lay them out and approach them in the most rational way possible. Um, that helps the developer feel heard. Because uh, oftentimes when you're confronted with 10 or 20 different bureaucrats, um, the answer is just gonna be, it's just too hard. Um, and that's not the best answer. So hopefully over time, as you kind of look strategically at, at starting a program office, um, you, you, you wanna take that first step. Uh, find, a, find a problem, find a concern, um, ideally from your developers that makes sense to your management um, and then resolve it and then go back to those same stakeholders and say, does this make sense? Do you find this was valuable? They say, yes, do more. They say, no, you can ask why. Um, and there could be a hundred reasons on what could be the impediment there. That's okay. That's open source. Uh, we're constantly making bugs and we're constantly resolving them. Um, so continue to learn and be open to those things. So summary, Ooh, it actually went a little, little bit quicker than I expected, um, but summary, um, compliance, community, character. Um, the three C's, you can, you can find a little bit of meaning in each of those that makes sense to your specific organization. Um, there may be ones that are, are stronger, they're, they're stronger needs, more immediate needs in your organization. Cool, that's okay. Invest there, uh, makes sense. Just don't, don't lose track of the others um, because you, you'll kind of be stunted. You'll, you'll rock around on your three-legged stool. Um, so you wanna be able to invest and kind of build this, this um, story and the narrative that's unique to your organization. Um, 
and, and, and always remember who you're responsible to. It isn't just your management. Um, you really need to be talking to your development teams. Uh, you really need to be talking to a lot of different people. Um, be constantly asking questions on if the things that you're putting in place, do they make sense? Do they bring value? Um, and generally, um, do people uh, see that the brand is doing better um, in this ecosystem because of the work that's going on? It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. There could be priority challenges, communication challenges. Uh, there's always opportunity to refine those things. Um, just like we would approach a release, do a retrospective, um, ask those hard questions, uh, take some good feedback and, or hopefully good feedback and probably some, some bad feedback uh, and, and process it. See what we can make different. Um, then figure out what your measurement is, then do. Um, again, making sure to be constantly returning value. Um, and then again, I think the more that you approach this as an organic approach, something that reflects your organization, how they're structured, uh, what they do, how they do it, um, it's going to be a more sustainable thing. We look at project sustainability, and again, there's no real difference to an OSPO sustainability. Um, it's really going to be making sense and providing value to people. Um, so a quote, uh, this actually just came up, uh, I was doing a, a, a training on Git. I uh, always need a refresher. Um, and I think it, was, it made sense to me, uh, especially as thinking about an OSPO. Because um, oftentimes when, when you're putting an OSPO in place, you all of a sudden become a little bit of a bottleneck. Um, did the OSPO say this was good? Did they say it was bad? Um, so what we want to be able to do, um, and, and DHOC is, uh, or, or previously the head of uh, Visa, um, but find things that make sense, simple patterns. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're right either. Um, they can just be where you're at today. Uh, it could be maturity, it could be controls, it could be a reason that you're choosing things. Uh, but you should document that motivation and then be able to kind of reevaluate that motivation uh, at an appropriate time to see if it still makes sense. Um, and the more that you build that trust with your, with your organization, with all the little domains and tribes that sit, in, sit within it, um, the more they're going to be willing to talk to you and ask you for changes uh, and recommend changes, maybe collaborate on changes. Uh, all of that stuff adds up over time to more credibility. Uh, credibility inside your organization, credibility outside your organization, um, which is going to be attractive. Uh, we talk about talent often when it comes down to open source and, and empowering developers to do cool things um, from our organizational platforms, uh, complete with a paycheck. Um, and that's, that just comes out. One of the natures of open source is it's transparent. Um, people can go and look at your GitHub um, and they'll measure you by that or they'll go and they'll look at the project that they're excited about and see, hey, I recognize that email address. Um, or they'll hear about stuff or they'll, back when we used to be able to meet face to face, uh, they'll ask where you were working. They were really excited with what you were talking about or they saw a commit, whatever it is, um, the more that your associates are, are reflecting well on your brand in these ecosystems and investing in common answers. Um, and they're doing it well with respect um, and a little bit of humility also. Um, the more that they may be willing to join up. Um, so sometimes it could be hard to measure those type of, of um, opportunities. Um, but if you look at half of the, half the uh, speakers at ATO, uh, I'm sure many of them were at different organizations a year ago or two years ago, um, because we're all, especially technologists, we're always driven by the next cool thing um, or that next challenge. 
Um, and sometimes we need to help that out, uh, kind of nudge it in a certain direction. So, and that's what I got.